Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are, and a warm welcome from Tucson. My name is Martin Ryman. I'm a professor at the University of Arizona, and I'm running the speaker series for the College of Veterinary Medicine. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you today uh, Jennifer Applebaum. Jennifer is an assistant professor in the Department of Environmental and Global Health at the University of Florida. She is trained as a medical sociologist with a background in animal sheltering, and her research focuses broadly on the implications of social inequality and on human and companion animal health and well-being. Jennifer draws from sociological theory to take a social approach to the One Health framework that you know encompasses both human and animal health and well-being, and her research is focused um, on the intersection of stress, structural level social processes, and social determinants of health and human animal uh, and the human animal bond. Jennifer has published uh, in her research in many different journals, including Animal, Animals and Frontiers and Plus One, a Journal of Aging and Health, so many different um, interesting research projects and publication coming out of her lab. So it's a real pleasure to have you here, Jennifer. The floor is all yours. Jennifer asked me just as a as a note um, to uh, have the questions and answers at the end of the talk. So hold your horses until the end of the talk, and then I will moderate the uh, the Q and A session for Jennifer, and people can uh, raise their hand um, and speak or put something in the chat. But this will be towards the end, and we have one hour, including the Q and A. So. Um, Jennifer, please. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm seeing some familiar faces. So hello, everyone, uh, new and old. <laughs> um, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be presenting for you all today. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the um, ways to think about human-animal interaction research within the social determinants of health framework. Um, I'll start by giving you a background on the social determinants of health or the SDOH, which is an easier way of saying it. And then um, I'll present some examples of ways that I've engaged uh, the framework in my own HAI research. And um, I'm also going to tell you a bit about my ongoing and upcoming um, work in this area. So uh, first is going to be a little crash course on the social determinants of health, and um, then we'll quickly get into how to think about them in relation to HAI. Um, so the SDOH are uh, the conditions in the environments where people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age that affects a wide range of health, functioning, and quality of life outcomes and risks. Um, these are the things that impact health that are not simply due to biology or genetics. And um, some examples are safe housing, transportation in neighborhoods, racism, discrimination, and violence, uh, education, job opportunities, and income access to nutritious foods and physical activity opportunities, polluted air and water, uh, language and literal literacy skills. And then, um, so just to briefly go over these like major areas, and this is a CDC framework, I should mention, there's also one um, from the World Health Organization, but this one is a little, um, uh, a little more condensed. So I <laughs> decided to present this one. Um, so in terms of economic stability, um, this area, <clears throat> is pretty straightforward in terms of like understanding how it impacts health. Um, so, you know, if you don't have enough money to afford healthy food, healthcare, or housing, um, this is of course going to impact your health. This can be direct such as um, in the healthcare and food examples or indirect such as um, the negative health effects of stress um, caused by economic insecurity and unstable housing. Um, education access and quality. So people with higher levels of education are more likely to be healthier and live longer. This is due to their ability to get higher paying jobs, as well as their ability to understand health information, innovations and technologies. Um, education also impacts our social network, which can, um, of course, impact your health um, via, you know, health promoting connections or the opposite end of the spectrum, where sometimes your social net network can damage your health. Um, many children live in places with poorly performing schools and many families can't afford to send their kids to college. Bullying and other social discrimination and marginalization 
can impact educational success. Um, and also the stress of poverty um, can negatively impact brain development and thus inhibit educational attainment. Um, this is another really straightforward one, um, healthcare access and quality. If you don't have access to high quality healthcare due to cost or transportation issues, um, long wait lists to see providers, um, if you don't see a primary care provider regularly, or more, maybe you're dealing with a stigmatizing health condition, and this can prevent you from seeing a doctor, um, you'll likely have poor health. Sorry, my dog is deciding to do some interesting thing behind me on the couch, but um, you'll all forgive me. <laughs> um, so social, or sorry, neighborhood and built environment. Um, the neighborhood environment is uh, a big one. So there is a whole area of social science research dealing with what they call neighborhood effects, um, showing that the places where you physically spend a lot of time, like especially where you live, can have a profound impact on your health. Um, this is due to things like safety, environmental exposures like lead in the drinking water or um, mold that you're inhaling um, in the air in your home, access or lack of access to green space um, for exercise and recreation, and um, how bike or walking friendly the area is. Um, and then last, social and community context. Um, our social and community context is, um, and of course, an important determinant of health, um, things like your social network, um, such as friends, family, and colleagues, um, social support, people who can help and support you when you need it. Um, of course, social marginalization, again, like discrimination can be extremely stressful and can seep into every part of your life and your perceived safety. And also your actual physical safety um, is highly dependent on your social context. Um, so if you're interested in understanding how pet ownership and HAI interacts um, with the social determinants of health, you need to start by understanding who owns pets um, in whatever geographic area you're interested in. And for this talk, um, we'll focus on the U.S. Um, so getting an idea of who owns pets in the U.S. may seem like a simple task, <laughs> um, but it's actually pretty complicated. Uh, we know how many people live in the U.S. because there's a census every 10 years, um, at and at least in theory, every person uh, living in the country is recorded. Um, the same thing, of course, has not been done for pets. Um, in fact, the census um, has never asked about pets in the home. And um, the best way can do for an estimate is to turn to survey efforts that use rigorous sampling methodology um, that uses you know, probability-based sampling and complicated weighting procedures to more or less match the census. Um, and arguably the best um, in terms of sampling is the U.S. General Social Survey, which is run by the National Opinion Research Center or NORC at University of Chicago. The problem, however, is that the General Social Survey doesn't regularly ask about pets. And the last time they asked was in 2018, uh, which the, those data came out in 2020. So a few things have happened since 2018 um, that you may be aware of things that impacted pet ownership. And yes, I'm referring to a global pandemic, um, among other things. So um, if you're interested um, in getting into a long and intricate conversation about this, you can follow up with Andrew Rowan. <laughs> um, he has a lot of thoughts about this and just published a recent news piece um, for his organization, uh, Wellbeing International. Um, so with all of this in mind, let me show you some findings from a paper we published in 2020 with the survey data. Um, and so I know this table is kind of a nightmare for this presentation, but bear with me. Um, so we found that um, women were more likely to have dogs and also multiple pets than men. Um, lower educational attainment was associated with bird ownership. Uh, lower income households are less likely to own dogs and multiple pets than those who make more money. Uh, white Americans are more likely to own any pets, dogs, cats, and multiple pets um, than any other racial groups, um, and Black Americans are the least likely. Most pet ownership peaks in middle age and declines as we get older. Um, city dwellers are the least likely to have the most pets, and those who live in rural areas are the most likely, so more pets in rural areas. Uh, married couples without kids tend to uh, be most likely to have pets, though adults with kids are most likely to have multiple pets. Um, single adults are the least likely to have um, most pets. And people living in multifamily housing are the least likely to have most pets. 
Um, so we can tie a lot of those social indicators of uh, pet ownership to the SDOH and start to think about big HAI questions like, are pets good for our health? Um, a social determinants approach to this question may tell us to look at context, um, who owns pets and what health advantages or disadvantages may they already have due to their social positions. Um, in my mind, these things become kind of inherently connected and they also lead us to a lot of um, interesting new research questions. So um, I only have time to present a few examples of applying the SEOH to HAI. So I've chosen the ones that I thought you almost find might find most interesting. Um, the first SEOH area I'll cover is housing. Um, I'll discuss some published work as well as some work in, prog in progress with a really exciting new data set that I just got access to. So I'm going to start by talking about this study, which was published in Frontiers in Veterinary Science in 2021. And apologies to those who have seen my talks before, but I present this one a lot because it, it is um, a banger. <laughs> People like it. So just to quickly cover um, a little bit of background and context, um, probably all of you know these things, but pet ownership is a known barrier to housing security. Um, and we also know that housing is a common reason for pet relinquishment. There are no federal limitations on the amount of extra money a landlord can charge in order to keep pets in the home. And landlords are also free to ban pets from properties altogether. Pet-friendly housing in the U.S. tends to be overall more expensive and less accessible than housing that doesn't allow pets. Um, policies about pets vary widely across the states, um, but in Texas, which is the setting of this study, um, they even have a policy that allows landlords to forcibly remove pets that they may deem a burden, and it's up to them to decide what a burden is. Um, and this is all in the context of an affordable housing crisis in Texas and more broadly across the U.S., um, which existed before the pandemic, but um, has certainly been exacerbated by it. Um, in the U.S., people of color are more likely than white people to be housing insecure, and this can be traced back to the racialized history of oppression in the U.S., including the legacy of redlining, um, which is still evident in residential segregation today. In addition to economic and historical barriers to housing for people of color in the U.S., non-white people and particularly Black Americans still today face race-related housing discrimination that can determine where they can secure leases regardless of any financial situation. And so um, we had two objectives for the study. Um, the first um, was uh, by analyzing the fees charged on top of monthly rent among pet-friendly housing we aim to examine the extent to which renting with pets may create an additional cost burden for renters in Texas. And second, um, by looking at spatial patterns in the fees paired with economic and racial and ethnic information by census tracts, we aim to assess the extent to which pet fees disproportionately burden low-income people compared to those who make more money and people of color compared to white people. Um, so in terms of methodology, we scraped close to 6,000 pet-friendly rental listings from apartments.com, which we then matched with data from the U.S. Census and American Community Survey by Census Tract. Um, from these data, we were able to assess monthly rent based on two-bedroom uh, pet-friendly apartment rental listings, the amount of pet fees and deposits charged on top of rent, median income by Census Tract, and um, proportion of racial and ethnic groups by Census Tract. Um, from these attributes, we were able to create a metric that we called pet fee, pet fee burden, which was calculated by taking the total amount of pet fees someone would pay on top of normal monthly rent and dividing by the census tract's uh, median income, which gave us an idea of the proportion of yearly income someone in that community would pay for their landlord um, just to keep their pets in their home. Um, and so we found that more expensive pet friendly apartments, which tended to be in higher income communities, tended not to have pet fees charged on top of normal monthly rent, whereas less expensive apartments in lower income communities did have pet fees charged on top of um, rent among their pet friendly units. Um, we also found that the cost burden of pet fees was greater for communities of color versus communities that were predominantly white meaning that on average, people who were not white were paying more of their income to keep pets in their homes in Texas. Um, and we can see here that the relationship, the relationship between pet fee burden, the proportion of people of color by census tract within the 20 biggest cities in Texas, um, essentially as the proportion of people of color in a census tract increases, as does the burden of pet fee in, um, that the residents are paying in their rentals. 
Um, and when we looked at this by census racial and ethnic groups, it revealed that this effect was most pr uh, prominent for Latinx or Hispanic people in this population. Um, and we also found uh, that there tended to be a positive relationship between Gini index, which is um, a metric that uh, shows income inequality, um, and pet fee burden spatial inequalities. So meaning that within cities with large income disparities, there were also many close together census tracts that had large disparities in pet fee burden. Um, Lubbock and Austin were outliers in that they both have relatively high inequality in both income and spatial pet fee burdens. Um, essentially, this means that people who live close to one another could have both very large disparities in their income, as well as large disparities in the amount of, amount of pet fees that they're paying as a function of their income. Um, and finally, we found that there was a relationship between pet fee burden proportion of residents of color and Gini index by city, which was especially noteworthy in Houston, where the evidence was um, strongest that pet fee burden inequality was related to both overall economic inequality and racial and ethnic housing inequalities. Um, so we found that the costs associated with housing a family that includes a pet disproportionately harm populations that are already economically disadvantaged and more likely to be housing insecure. Uh, Pet-friendly re rental units come at a higher relative cost for low-income communities and communities of color, especially um, those who are Latinx or Hispanic in Texas. Um, we did find, uh, expect to find more evidence of this in Black communities, but we suspect this didn't show up as a significant relationship um, due to partially da uh, data limitations, as well as the fact that there, um, there's evidence that Black communities tend to have less pet-friendly housing altogether. Um, so those units that don't allow pets at all wouldn't be represented in this data set. Um, pet fees are a discriminatory practice that inevitably leads to poor housing security and potentially increased evictions. And um, we argue that pet fees should be regulated federally in order to reduce racial and socioeconomic disparities in pet-friendly housing security. Um, and so this paper received some press interest when it came out. Um, a journalist wrote about it for Dame Magazine, and then the story was picked up by NPR um, for the Here and Now program. Um, and I'm a big NPR fan, so this is extremely <laughs> exciting for me. Um, and subsequently, the study also caught the eye of policymakers. Um, I won't go through each of these items here, but this paper has been referenced in several congressional sessions by policy advocates and lawmakers um, to support um, reforming pet-friendly housing policy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I firmly believe that this is a really um, important part of my role as a social scientist um, to impact policy. Um, it's been really rewarding to see this work penetrate into discussions around policy as well as in the popular media. Um, and so as a follow-up um, to this work, um, we've obtained five years of intake data from 21 shelters across the U.S. Um, from the Human Animal Support Services Organization, which is part of American Pets Alive. Um, and so first we know that housing is a common reason for shelter relinquishment, but most of the data used to draw these conclusions are pretty old, like from a few papers in the 1990s, um, or they're from a single shelter, a geographic area. Um, and second, anyone who has worked with shelter data knows that they uh, the data tend to be kind of low quality. Um, it's often hard to decipher what the intake reason reasons really mean. And um, historically, anything housing related would usually just be labeled as housing um, without any additional information. And so these organizations have been working with shelters across North America to make shelter data more consistent and detailed to allow for larger scale analyses of shelter animal trends across the U.S. and beyond. Um, this data contains over 28,000 um, housing related intake records from the 21 shelters that agreed to be part of this program um, as a test case for the past five years. Um, and so I'm gonna present some preliminary findings from the data related to housing. And I literally did these analyses yesterday, so it is very fresh. Um, so first, um, this is a look at the condensed uh, subtypes of housing related intake reasons. And we started with 51, 51 different categories here. So we condensed them down to five. Um, on the far right in this chart, we had a lot of miscellaneous types of intakes, which is kind of a catch-all category for anything related to 
moving or things labeled housing without any more specific information. Um, this accounts for nearly 15,000 of the intakes. Um, but as you can see, the restrictions um, category was the second most common one. Um, and that includes anything related to policies that don't allow certain types of pets like breed, breeder size restrictions, um, which was around seven to 8,000. And again, that's um, that's intakes due to uh, breeder size restrictions um, on housing. So landlord, um, that category is anything that was coded with unspecified landlord conflicts, um, which was around two to 3,000 records. And in the left two groups, there are um, loss of home, which includes foreclosure, evictions, and other housing loss, and unhoused, which was a category indicating that the owner was experiencing homelessness. Um, so this is the size distribution of the animals in the data set. Uh, this was kind of a surprise to me because I would have expected that uh, most housing related intakes would be larger dogs, um, but it looks like the small animals um, make up the largest category for housing related intakes in this data set. Um, and the type of animal, uh, dogs do account for more housing related intakes than cats. And it's important to note that here, the size wasn't broken down by um, animal type. And so, you know, it's possible that the smalls were mostly cats, et cetera, but um, further analyses needed. Um, and so this one is really interesting, I think. Um, this is a chart showing the proportion of intake types separated separated out by live outcome on the right. So um, meaning the animal left the shelter alive, like adoption, transfer, return to owner, TNR, um, on the left is the non-life outcome, which includes euthanasia, died or lost in care. Um, and so the restrictions intake related to policies and breed restrictions um, shows better live outcome to non-life outcome comparison, whereas landlord issues are more likely to result in non-life outcomes. Um, miscellaneous is hard to interpret. Those were anything labeled like moving or housing miscellaneous, et cetera. Um, but those also had a higher likelihood to resi result in a non-live outcome. Um, and not entirely sure what to make of this yet, but um, I thought it was interesting and you all might agree that's interesting. Um, so we're working on a paper with these and some additional findings. Um, so look out for that hopefully later this year. So moving on now to the impact of pet ownership on healthcare access and util utilization. Um, so the idea for this came from conversations with physicians and other providers in different healthcare set settings. Um, many of these folks, doctors, nurses, social workers, have told me that they've had patients leave the hospital or not receive care because of their pets at home. Um, for example, patients who left care against medical advice because they had to care for their pet at home. Um, and so um, there were like two papers uh, that I was aware of at the time um, that were getting at this concept. And um, when the COVID outbreak uh, started in spring of 2020, I was curious about the impact of pet welfare on healthcare decision making and access during this public health emergency. And so really briefly, um, we published this study in the journal One Health in late 2020 this was based on a convenience sample of 3,000 pet owners in the U.S., which was collected um, early in the pandemic, April through July of 2020. Um, and so it was a convenience sample again. So it has a lot of, um, you know, uh, issues related to, um, you know, representation of, of groups. But um, we uh, did find that 10 to 12 percent of our sample indicated they would delay or avoid COVID related health care because they were worried about their pet's welfare. Um, in regression models, um, we found that the likelihood of this was higher for participants with higher pet attachment, lower for those with more social support and for those with more people in their household. And um, quite a bit higher for those who indicated they were worried about their um, economic stability due to COVID. Um, and for those who endorsed that they would delay or avoid COVID healthcare due to their pets, we asked them to explain why. Um, and these I'm showing here, just two excerpts from participants. Um, the first is, my dog is a management case for reactivity to people and other dogs and can only be watched by a few, uh, very few select people. And so this person was worried that they wouldn't have access to um, pet care if they needed COVID-related health care. And uh, the second is, I don't want to be shipped off to a hospital for three plus weeks and my pets be all alone. They'll die. Also, I'll be bankrupt from the medical bills afterwards. And then how would I pay for their care or a home for us to live in? 
Um, and this participant was reflecting on both their perceived lack of available contingency care for their pets and the economic implications of medical bills from COVID healthcare. And so given the sample limitations that I mentioned, um, we wanted to see how these pet-related healthcare barriers, as we were calling them, would look in other populations. Um, and so we teamed up with the Southern HIV and Alcohol Research Consortium, or SHARC. Um, and I was very interested more broadly in pet ownership and the human animal bond among people with HIV, and especially how the concepts we developed and tested during COVID would apply to this population, um, who tend to be overrepresented by people from marginalized backgrounds um, and who require frequent interactions with the healthcare system. Um, Shark has an ongoing survey study of people with HIV in Florida called the Florida Cohort, and um, I was awarded a pilot grant to fund a survey module um, for about HAI topics for the pet owners in this cohort. Um, oh, and uh, this paper was just recently published in PLUS One. Um, so as we've already discussed, um, there's evidence that pet owners may delay or forgo healthcare or leave inpatient treatment against medical advice in order to take care of their pets. Um, this is especially true for those who are particularly bonded to their pets, have insufficient social support from people, fewer economic resources, and those who belong to marginalized groups. Um, the existing literature about pet ownership among people with HIV suggests that pets may be a facilitator or motivator to maintaining health in this population. Pets offer people with HIV non-judgmental emotional support and companionship, and this is especially true for those who are otherwise socially isolated. Um, the development and widespread implementation of antiretroviral therapy uh, has fundamentally changed the prognosis of HIV from fatal to that of a manageable chronic disease. However, strict adherence to the um, antiretroviral therapy treatment regimen uh, and regular health maintenance are essential to management of HIV, which can be a challenge for people who face barriers to timely, health, high quality health care. And so um, we know that pet caretaking responsibilities may interfere with healthcare access, and we also have evidence that relationships with pets may be especially salient emotional support for people with HIV. Um, and so we wanted to move toward identifying potential interventions in order to support healthcare access for people with HIV who have pets, while simultaneously supporting the human-animal bond. Therefore, um, we start here by understanding the scope of the issue among people with HIV, as well as identifying subgroups that may be most at risk for these uh, pet-related barriers to healthcare access. So the aims of the study were to assess uh, whether and the extent to which pets may impede access to healthcare for people with HIV, and second, identify factors that predict the likelihood of experiencing pet-related barriers to healthcare for this population. Um, this is part of a larger survey called the Florida Cohort, which is a longitudinal survey of people with HIV in Florida run by the Southern HIV and Alcohol Research Consortium. The goal of the study um, is to assess how individual clinic and community level factors influence healthcare accessibility and utilization um, and HIV clinical outcomes across the state of Florida. Um, so they recruit mostly through HIV care providers throughout Florida, patient registries, participant referrals, and um, remotely via uh, advertising. So data collection for this wave of the Florida cohort started in 2021 and wrapped up um, toward the like in fall of, of 2023. Um, so participants are eligible for several survey modules that cover general health, healthcare utilization, behavioral and social factors, um, substance use, and mental health. And if the participants identified themselves as pet owners, they're eligible to complete a module that is specific to interactions with pets. Um, the pet module is available in English and Spanish, and participants are compensated for each model module they complete. So a snapshot here of the um, 204 pet module participants, um, socio-demographic socio information. Um, the median income was um, $10,000 per year. Um, in terms of race, 66% were white, 28% black, and 6% were other races. 18% um, identified as Latinx or Hispanic. A little over half had a college education. 57% uh, were cisgender men, 40% cisgender women. Um, we didn't have any trans men represented in the sample. Um, and 2% 2 were trans women and 1% reported other genders. 
age ranged from 20 to 75 with an average of 49. So the PEP module includes, um, as I mentioned, a variety of HAI measures that are intended to assess the positive, negative, and neutral aspects of pet ownership among this population. And this study is focused on an index of pet-related barriers to healthcare that we developed for this survey module. The index includes a series of 12 questions designed to assess uh, whether the participant experienced or anticipated any barriers to accessing timely healthcare or health-related services due to pet caregiving or concerns about pet welfare. So eight questions asked about previously experienced barriers, including delays to health services, leaving inpatient care or missing care due to worry about a pet um, or the need to take care of a pet. And we also asked about financial barriers to healthcare related to pets. Um, four items asked about anticipated future barriers, such as health services delays or deferments due to emotional or physical welfare of a pet. And so um, as a quick aside, we're currently working on a validation paper for this index. So um, that should hopefully be out later this year. Um, so the figure here displays the proportions of the pet module participants who endorsed each item in the index. 36% um, of the sample endorsed at least one item in the index. Um, and the item that was endorsed most frequently was, would you delay seeking health services if you could not care for your pet? Um, that was 25% of the sample. And the least frequently endorsed item was, have your pets ever impacted your ability to pay for medi medication, which was just 4%. 17% um, endorsed at least one item indicating experience barriers and 31% endorsed items in indicating um, anticipated barriers. Um, so these results are from the a negative binomial model, which tested the effects of comfort from companion animals, social support, income, race, and Latinx ethnicity on the predicted number of pet-related barriers to healthcare. This figure shows the effects of comfort from um, companion animals in blue and social support in orange on the predicted number of barriers endorsed. Um, so essentially as comfort from companion animals increases, the number of barriers also increases and, um, social support does the opposite. So as perceived social support increases, the number of barriers, uh, decreases. So this indicates that those who reported that they get a lot of emotional comfort from their pets or bondage to their pet, um, and those who have less access to social support from people are more likely to have more barriers related to their pets. These are results of a logistic regression um, estimating the likelihood of having previously experienced at least one pet-related barrier to healthcare. Um, and so the top two items here are continuous variables. So the value you see is you know, indicating a one-unit change in the scale. Um, so as social support, which is on a 48-point scale, increases, the likelihood of having experienced a previous pet-related barrier to healthcare decreases. Um, and for those whose household income is $30,000 per year and over, compared to those who have household income of less than $10,000 per year, um, they're more likely to have experienced pet-related barriers. And so this is kind of a finding that would be go against our hypothesis, um, but I'll come back to that in a little bit. And um, to sum it up, those with most more social support and who make less money um, are less likely to have experienced um, previous pet-related barriers to healthcare. And so um, this is the model, um, the second model predicting um, the likelihood of anticipating future pet-related barriers to healthcare. Um, and so social support was again significant in this model, um, more social support, less likely to anticipate future barriers. Um, on the other hand, comfort from companion animals had the opposite effect. Um, so more comfort, more barriers. Um, income acts a lot differently in this model than the previous one. Those in households making ten dollars to $30,000 per year were less likely to anticipate future barriers than those making less than $10,000. So this is more in the directional um, hypothesis that one would expect. Um, and so and also, as you can see, the predictions for the higher income categories were in the same direction, but those were not significant. Um, so this is the a plot of um, a moderation model um, to test whether social support moderated the effect of income on the likelihood of anticipating future barriers. Um, and so 
Um, below $50,000 per year household income, social support doesn't really appear to make much of a difference. However, for those in households with comparably higher yearly income, social support um, is pretty important. Um, among this income group, those with low social, low social support had a significantly higher probability of anticipating future barriers than those with mid or high social support. Um, in contrast, those with, in this income group who reported high social support had a much lower probability of anticipating uh, future barriers. And so um, our findings suggest that a notable proportion of people, uh, pet owning people with HIV may experience barriers to their own health care that are associated with owning a pet. Um, more of the participants endorse items anticipating future barriers than items reporting um, previously actually experienced barriers. Um, so these barriers to healthcare may be especially salient for those who have less access to social support, um, which showed up as an important factor in all the models. Um, and um, additionally, those who are particularly bonded to their pets may be more likely to prioritize their pets' needs over their own. Um, so income is an important factor, though it didn't always really behave as expected. Um, but we have, so my, uh, guess as to what's happening here is that um, these questions are being extended into a marginalized and stigmatized population, um, and things don't always act the same as in high SES disproportionately white samples, which is um, what generally these questions had been tested on previously. Um, so the average income range for the sample was comparably quite a bit lower than the samples um, from previous studies on this topic. And so higher income in this case doesn't necessarily represent those who have ample economic resources to support things like pet boarding or pet sitting. Um, this also became evident in the moderation model. Um, it's possible that those who have a household income below $50,000 per year, um, things are really complicated and social support doesn't seem to make much of a difference either way. Um, but for those with comparably higher income, again, which is not super high, um, social support was really important. And as a last note, um, those in the lower income categories may also have access to more social services um, that are income qualified than those who are kind of just above that threshold and in that kind of gray area of, you know, still not making enough income to really have and do the things that they need, but um, not low enough to qualify for, for social um, welfare type, type programs. Okay. Um, so, so now to kind of triangulate this concept of pet related barriers to healthcare, um, and also thinking more about HAI and healthcare systems, um, I'll tell you about my ongoing collaboration with a computational sociologist. Um, together, we're working on a project using natural language processing to investigate um, patient HAIs in human electronic health records. Um, so... Obviously, you all know there's been decades of research on HAI and health, um, and more recently, some research researchers, um, including myself, <laughs> what I just presented to you, um, have asked how uh, pets impact healthcare access and utilization. Um, and so considering the association of pets with a multitude of health outcomes, um, many researchers have suggested that human health providers should be asking their patients about pets. Um, for example, asking older adults if they need assistance with pets in their home. Patients might need contingency care if they were to become hospitalized, those kind of situations. Um, what we don't know is if providers have taken these suggestions and are actually talking about pets with their patients. And additionally, if pets are at all related, uh, related to the reasons that patients have entered care or left care, that should show up in these electronic health records. Um, the problem, however, is that standard analysis of electronic health records is quantitative in nature, and researchers generally only have access to predetermined codes and categories re uh, regarding treatments and diagnoses and so on. And of course, currently, uh, we don't have a category, do you have a pet? Yes or no, probably should, but it's not, it's not there. Um, so we wanted to gain access to the qualitative notes in the electronic health records um, that are made by all the providers, doctors, nurses, and so on that may contain information about pets and HAIs more broadly. Um, the problem here is that we'd have to use qualitative methods for the analysis of these records, which can be extremely laborious and time consuming and really isn't feasible for researchers to hand code, code 
hand code hundreds of thousands or even millions of records. Um, so what we chose to develop and employ is a novel application of natural language processing or an L NLP, which is essentially a set of computational tools primarily designed for the large scale content analysis of free text. <clears throat> So um, our aims were, again, to develop a novel application of NLP in electronic health records to identify patient HAIs, um, and second, explore the context of and associations with HAIs in the records, um, meaning who are the patients talking about pets and how and why are they talking about them. <clears throat> So um, we're working with University of Florida's Integrated Data Repository, which is a service that aggregates health data across the UF health systems. Um, we're starting with a pilot data set of approximately 90,000 patients who left the emergency department without being seen or um, left AMA against medical advice between the years 2017 to 2022. Um, the data are from UF Health's emergency departments in Gainesville and Jacksonville, Florida. Um, and they're de-identified, but still include sociodemographic information, including zip codes, um, as well as the medical record information pertaining to the patient's status, their diagnoses, treatments, and so on. And um, for the application of the NLP analysis that I'll talk about in the next slide, um, we've received the qualitative free text notes made by the providers. <clears throat> and I should mention there's... Um, millions of records that we're dealing with now. Um, so we're taking uh, multiple approaches for the analysis. Um, we'll use keyword clustering and large language models to identify any and all instances of pets and animals referenced in the records. Um, and once we've identified HAI and pet mentions in the, and their frequencies, we'll consider how variation by the references to HAIs track along social dimensions and health outcomes. Um, beyond identifying references to pets and animals, we will use these same tools um, for further analysis of HAI and human healthcare. Um, this will include finding subject verb object relationships between animals and patients in the EHR and how they relate to health outcomes. So tone and content and context. <clears throat> So we recently received these data, which includes millions of text records, as I mentioned, and we started by running a keyword search for types of animals. Um, and these are a few snippets from a random sample of just 100 key of those keyword hits. So this first um, snippet is the patient continuously screamed out, help me, help me. This RN nurse um, checked out on the patient and he yelled that he needed to leave due to his guinea pig and dog being left alone in his home. This nurse asked if the patient had anyone to call for assistance in taking care of the animals in question. This nurse was informed that he did not have anybody and nobody would be able to get into his place. This nurse uh, spoke with the patient, uh, or sorry, with the social worker about the patient concerns. Um, another snippet, this it's a little upsetting. Mom explained patient may have uh, be having a psychotic break with loss of a uh, family dog recently. Really sad. Um, and then this one's kind of long, but bear with me. It's a really interesting one. Um, while providing coverage for the emergency department, social worker was consulted regarding the patient's service dog in need of placement. Social worker met with the patient at, patient at bedside following chart review. Social worker introduced self and purpose of social worker visit. Patient states she's currently residing at a domestic violence shelter and was unable to leave service dog at the facility. Patient states she has no one to care for her dog and does not understand why dog cannot remain in with her at the hospital given he's her service dog. Patient was informed at this time that the hospital is unable to accommodate the service dog and unless she's able to take this um, the dog out. I think what that means is uh, take the dog out to, to go uh, to the bathroom. Um, given she's unable to take the service dog at this time, alternative placement is needed for the service dog. Social worker attempted to con contact an animal shelter. However, they did not open until noon today. Social worker contacted pet rescue and left a message to contact social worker. Social workers um, spoke with the bedside nurse in the unit. Bedside indicates the patient advised a friend will be coming to get the service dog. So it worked out for that patient, but caused a lot of problems along the way. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so in terms of potential implications of this work, um, based on the findings, we could make recommendations for human health providers in terms of how to effectively communicate with patients about pets. And we could also consider the utility of community-based programs for supporting hospitalized pet owners. <clears throat> okay, um, shifting gears now to briefly talk about some more current work related to pet stress and substance use. 
So going back here to the Florida cohort, um, the study of people with HIV in Florida, in some preliminary analyses, we found um, an interesting trend. Uh, we published this as a brief report in Frontiers in Psychiatry in October. Um, pet owners were significantly more likely than non-owners to have ever used most, most uh, substances, most um, uh, illegal, well, not all illegal, but um, recreational drug use. Um, currently use some substances and use alcohol specifically in a hazardous or harmful manner. And so um, the results of a multivariate logistic regression predicting likelihood of harmful or hazardous alcohol use are here on the right. Um, we found that pet owners had nearly twice the odds of um, harmful or hazardous alcohol use than non-owners above and beyond things like age, race, ethnicity, income, education, and gender. Um, and so given the current state of the literature suggesting that pet owners are doing better than non-owners on a multitude of health outcomes, you'd probably expect the opposite here. And so um, why are we seeing these results? And um, our best guess at this point is related to stress. Um, this model here is the something a lot of you have probably seen. It's the human animal interaction hypothalamic pituitary adrenal transactional model or the HAI HPA model. Um, so I'm definitely not a neuroscientist, so I'll not try to explain the things going on in the brain here. You can ask Evan later. But essentially, um, this model proposes that positive interactions with pets can be beneficial at several stages in the stressful event to health outcomes continuum via downregulation of the physiological stress response system. And this is from Pendry and Vandegriff. Um, so as this is related to addiction disorders, um, this is a conceptual model from George Koob. He's the director of the um, Alcohol Institute at NIH that shows a, a progression of substance use from impulsive to compulsive via negative reinforcement. Essentially, people continue to use compulsively in order to relieve stress and anxiety they experience when in a withdrawal state. Um, this also relates to the concept of self-medication, which proposes that some people use substances to relieve stress. And so combining these models and also going back to the social determinants of health um, is my working model. Essentially, the reason we saw those associations among people with HIV, that pet owners are more likely to, have, uh, to be heavier substance users than non-owners, is related to this proposed idea that folks are experiencing high levels of stress and maybe seeking various coping mechanisms, which could go in the direction of substance use as well as seeking comfort from a pet. Um, this is all, of course, dependent on a lot of other stress-related variables like human social support, resource access, and the type of relationship someone has with their pet. Um, as some researchers have, have shown, including myself, pets are not always effective stress relief and can often cause or exacerbate stress, um, for example, especially in resource-constrained environments, like in our housing examples. So the efficacy of interactions with pets um, to be a viable coping mechanism would be highly dependent on the nature of the relationship between the pet, the uh, person and their pet, as well as extenuating circumstances related to stress. Um, so obviously a lot of things to work out here, but it's um, an insight into some of my predictions and future directions. Um, and based on these working conceptual models, our next step with the Florida cohort data is to see, um, is to investigate longitudinal HIV outcomes by pet ownership status and see whether they're moderated by substance use behaviors and among the pet owners, variation in relationships and interactions with pets. Um, and beyond that, I plan to collect qualitative interview data and physiological measures of chronic stress um, among pet owners with addiction disorders to try to understand if and how pets are impacting their substance use behaviors and experiences of addiction um, as mediated by stress. Um, thank you. Thank you.